If there is one thing that the New Testament makes absolutely clear, it is that the apostles never expected Jesus to rise from the dead. Oh, they were fascinated by his words, inspired by his preaching, deeply intrigued by his personality. They certainly had hoped that he would be the promised Messiah, would bring liberation from the Romans and a profound spiritual renewal of God's holy covenant with his people, Israel. But after Jesus was betrayed, arrested, judged, tortured, nailed to a cross, and put to death, they basically assumed that the story was over. Certainly on Easter morning, they heard some confused stories from the holy women about an empty tomb and about angels and their announcement of resurrection. Peter and John had run to the tomb, but only John, the beloved, he alone had remained faithful beneath the cross, and he alone at that moment at the tomb came to full faith. Easter evening found the apostles in the upper room trembling and terrified, locked behind closed doors and shuttered windows. They reasonably feared that the Lord's fate could easily become their fate. They were entirely intimidated by Pilate and the Romans. They were terrified of the high priest and the temple police. They hoped they might be safe if they could just keep a low profile and then eventually, with a bit of luck, just sneak out of town and go back to their past lives as fishermen. Now who could blame them, given what had just happened to Jesus? But locked doors and fearful hearts were no barrier to the risen Christ. Jesus himself suddenly appeared in their midst in that barricaded upper room. The risen Christ proclaimed a new security when he said, Peace be with you. He showed them his hands and his side. He was no ghost, no spiritual vision. Christ had truly risen. To their absolute amazement, Christ had risen in the flesh. They could touch him. He would eat with them. He would commission them, saying, just as the Father sent me, so now do I send you. And then he breathed upon them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And he gave them the same authority that he himself possessed to forgive sins. But Thomas, one of the twelve, wasn't there in the upper room at that time. Now, in the Gospel of John, Thomas functions as a kind of representative figure of all of the practical, hard-headed Galilean fishermen that made up the body of apostles. Throughout the fourth Gospel, Thomas presents some typical attitudes that were held among the Lord's closest followers. These were country folk, not much given to flights of fancy. They were slow to believe and hard to convince. For example, Thomas was present on the occasion when word came to Jesus about the sickness and then the death of the Lord's good friend Lazarus. At first, Thomas certainly doesn't understand that Lazarus was already dead. And when he finally agrees to travel with Jesus back 
back into all the threats and dangers of Judea, he rather pessimistically predicts they probably all end up being put to death. During the Last Supper, when Jesus tells the apostles that he is going away and they already know where he is going, once again it is Thomas who rather peevishly declares, we do not know the way, so how can we know where you are going? Once again, we meet Thomas in today's Gospel, where once again, he just doesn't understand, and he refuses to believe. Doubting Thomas even stubbornly declares, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now the name Thomas means twin in Aramaic, just as Didymus means twin in Greek, and as the scriptures call him, Thomas called Didymus certainly is the twin of all those who try to follow Christ, but are slow to grasp and so very hesitant to accept the extravagance and the endless quality of God's power and love. One week later, the apostles are still locked inside behind bolted doors. This time, however, Thomas is there among them. And once again, Jesus passes through all the barriers of closed minds and locked hearts. Peace be with you, he says. And the glorified, risen Christ shows Thomas the visible signs of his passion and death. Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas, once again, representing the twelve, perhaps representing all of us, he is the twin of all those who must come to grips with the awe and the wonder of the Lord's victory over sin and death. He finally declares, my Lord and my God. Jesus had demonstrated his complete sovereignty over life and death. Jesus is fully revealed as the Kyrios, the Lord, the Greek translation of God's own most sacred and explicit name, Yahweh. Jesus is shown as the very Son of God, equal to the Father. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is God. What a wonderful gospel for all the new Catholic Christians, baptized, received, or confirmed, and certainly nourished at the Eucharistic table just one week ago at the Easter Vigil. What an appropriate and essential message for all Catholic Christians who just last Sunday renewed our own baptismal faith and promises. And what a great gospel for all of us celebrating Mercy Day when all are invited to let go of the burden of our past sins and accept what St. Peter in today's second reading described as an imperishable inheritance, undefiled and unfading. And what wonderful and providential scriptures appointed for this day when Pope Francis has canonized good John the 23rd and John Paul the Great. God keeps on doing things we would never expect. God's love and God's forgiveness give us much greater safety than any kind of locked doors. The revelation of God in Jesus Christ shows us the greatest possible truth. Once again, as Peter reminds us, although you have not seen him, you love him. Even though you do not see him now, 
you believe in him. You rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy as you attain the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Once again, Thomas is our twin, perhaps, representing us when he hears from the very lips of Jesus a wonderful new beatitude. This beatitude was not given to John, but through him was given to us. Jesus said, Blessed are those who have not seen, but have believed. May we all, all our lives long, believe in Jesus. And may we all, all our lives long, be blessed beyond compare. In the gift of his love and his mercy, which is everlasting, and in the power of the new life given by his glorious victory, his wondrous resurrection from the dead. <laughs>